Yeah. Welcome everyone. So um, we will have this talk in English, as I heard today. So this shouldn't be a problem. Um, that's uh, Philip Schrödel and I'm Max Morso. So I just recognized that we didn't include our email addresses in the talk, but I, I guess you will find it anyway. Um, <clears throat> this talk basically is about uh, plugin we have written during the last few <laughs> basically months, but uh, in fact it was during the last four days <laughs> completely rewritten. Uh, and at the end, it wasn't a problem in the code, it was a hardware issue. It was really uh, strange. Anyway, uh, now it's working. What is the talk all about? Uh, what is this plugin all about? We will see that basically it's very simple. It adds to the Metasploit uh, session and job handling ability. So this means that we can really uh, start to define test cases and distribute it, the functionality of a, of a exploitation framework or a botnet to, um, uh, to the power of, of good of the enterprise. So, hello everyone. Um, we started the project actually um, because of a requirement um, and we wanted to test some uh, client um, uh, configuration settings and stuff like that. Uh, we had searched different odd products and uh, these are with the requirements uh, of this tool. So um, if we are testing a client, um, we have to collect a large amount of data. Uh, we have to interpret them. We have to analyze them, um, visualize them to get proper reports and results, actually. Yeah, we actually thought for this talk, let's get a step back from our testing needs. Uh, in terms of security test, product tests, and we thought, well, what's the general idea of testing? And testing in general is always you have procedures for testing something, whatever it is, and usually you're collecting a lot of information, a lot of data in terms of computer testing, and then you somehow have to analyze it. So this was the whole basic um, uh, idea then to uh, try to ease up the recurring tasks and especially if you if you look at there's a slide oh, okay if you look at security tests um, there is a, a major problem if you want to to do it at a larger scale so the problem with testing usually is it works quite easy if you test one thing it doesn't even have to be computers but if you test a multiple thing with identical um, ideas it's it's quite different to st scale it Especially now if you go into a, a network environment where you have different uh, platforms, different uh, policies, different uh, behaviors maybe from the administrator, so it, it's quite challenging um, and it usually needs manual adoptions. I mean, you have your testing scripts, maybe you have your procedures where you follow and then you, you adopt it. Um, during the review of, let's say, the market, what is available out there, we recognize that the problem with automated testing, independent if it's a software or, or um, a software functionality test or vulnerability assessment, quite often you have just one single point of view in the result. So a software is trying, for example, that the intended functionality is working, but it never tells you anything about the underlying system. Or uh, you have a network-based vulnerability assessment. Yeah, that's fine but you don't get the configuration of the box if it's correctly configured. So, um, and then there are some tools which, for example, verify you the system configuration, but quite often does not um, take in consideration how the environment looks like. So uh, we will see later on that you have quite a lot of specific needs if you want to do that in, in, in software and you want to test your security of a system and measure actually the individual controls, how well did they work and did they work. <coughs> yeah. The, uh, one of the specific tests, which is not easily found in most products, is for example something quite easy for a human being to test, 
is let's call it uh, outbound testing. So you want to verify that your restriction policy in the Expo or in a proxy server actually works. So this sounds quite easy. Just go to a website and look if you get the right answers. But uh, you can never tell which component, for example, is blocking the whole communication. Why is blocking? Is it just because you cannot resolve DNS? Or is there a firewall? Stuff like that. And the most difficult part is really the effect, effect, if efficiency measurement. So which control was how effective if we turn to risk terms. So we try to abstract basically really abstract that whole security testing. So you have something like vulnerability assessment, then you have some, some penetration tests, uh, likely when you're done with vulnerability assessments and you didn't find your way in, you usually do additional tests. This could be a host, a network, a application. So um, really, let's say, search for stuff which is not discovered automatically because it's already well known. So this is usually a highly manual uh, thingy. And I mean, it depends on the scope. If you look from a, uh, from a testing environment on, on, on penetration test, maybe you have the, the, the need to gain access to the system, but this is quite often, this is completely optional. I don't care about root if I get the data. Um, but for sure, you will collect a shitload of data if you do assessments. And you have to, to somehow consolidate the information and generate reports. And everyone which is doing uh, tests know that the reporting is, is the most intense uh, part. In fact, it's not really the, uh, the reporting, it's the, the interpretation before you actually write the sentence. So the know-how between what you know, what your belly is telling you, what is going wrong in there, and um, and the actual writing of the reports. Optional, I mean, that depends on your skill set and on your scope and in your environment. You have to pivot through a system to gain further access. For example, you get access to an um, unsecure web server, so you can pivot through that to, to gather additional information of the DM set, stuff like that. This really depends on, on the scope, but that's basically what we see as a very high level a test for security systems. <coughs> Doesn't work. Okay. So um, this is uh, uh, how we, um, our idea, how we implemented the whole thing. Um, the first thing we have to do is uh, to get access to the client we want to test anyhow. This can be um, simply by executing a program, or can be uh, archived through uh, an exploit, maybe, or executed via login, a script, or a software distribution mechanism. So we have a binary which has to be executed on the client. This is actually also different to most of the products we looked at. Most of them are based on an agent which must be installed, highly privileged, and constantly running. Constantly yeah. running, have open ports and probably also vulnerabilities. Yeah, yeah. next the uh, server, uh, basically the client connects if it's executed to the server, <coughs> and the server looks up for prepared test cases. And I mean, that's really the new thing. I mean, the rest is basically what Metasploit already provides you. So um, you can basically prepare test cases which need to be executed. And um, yeah, at the end, tests can be started from the server side or from the client side, which allows you to collect information on both point of view. Um, if you have a pivoting task, you can easily change that information additionally. So what is possible from the third hop or from the first one. So you basically, we will have some examples where you can easily see that. But the idea is that you collect both views, network side and internal one, and then you collect the data. So, yeah. Yeah. Then actually um, everything is collected by the server. At the moment this is stored. Uh, with XML, uh, in the near future maybe it's getting database based or this is open at the moment. 
it's uh, easy to change it, you know, uh, as you can imagine, it's not really a problem. Uh, and at the end, there is a reporting task. This can be implemented. We have some examples here, but that's basically not part of our framework. It's completely up to you how to use it. So, in fact, we were using Metasploit to gain access. That's quite simple. It provides me a lot of uh, different abilities. I mean, there are now uh, Metasploit um, server sites part which is implemented in Java, in PHP, in DLL style, there is a POSIX one available. So if you get access to it, you can execute basically the server side of the Metaprator uh, payload. So that's basically what we are um, basing on, on the server side, on, on, on the client, which will be attacked. I mean, it's pretty crazy with the client and server, but that's basically a server uh, working on the client as long as you test. Um, then, I mean, Metasploit provides all the core functionalities, file searches, upload, download, registry. You can even directly call AP API calls. You can attach to memory. Uh, you can build basically whatever you want. It's not that easy always, but it provides the framework that can be easily used. Um, yeah, basically, at the end, we're just extending the, uh, the Metasploit, Metaprator language by further abstracting it to write simpler test cases, which an administrator should be able to do. So uh, it's not always that easy to implement it natively using Metaprator scripts. And in fact, the session handling was completely missing. So this sounds like a botnet. Absolutely. I mean, <coughs> yes, functionality-wise, it's, it's exactly a botnet with a common and control center. Uh, it's kind of strange that the bad guys are actually having that already properly, and the market out there is quite uh, split between compliance verification and vulnerability assessment, and in between there's not much. For example, a product for configuration validation is quite, um, quite, are quite raw at the moment. I mean. Even older products aren't existing anymore or replaced by a very cool compliance scanner which actually cannot even handle any more simple verification of registry keys. So um, it's really strange that the market does not have such products available uh, which aren't overblown or extremely expensive. So the next few slides describe the individual components. I guess we can uh, just explain it right from the picture so we don't lose the context. Yeah, um, so as we said, um, point one is the client side executable. Um, this gets executed at the meta preview session and connects back to the Metasploit framework. After that, the Current plugin takes over the session, looks up in a database uh, <coughs> based on <coughs> the IP or the MAC address or CDR address of the client which is connecting, what jobs does uh, the client has to execute, and reads these templates uh, from a very simple instruction file. Yeah, we call them instruction files. Uh, basically, it's just a set of instructions. That's why we call it that way. <coughs> Um, yeah, after it's, uh, it's getting the instructions, both sides can actually execute test cases. So, either the server side can basically attack the client or the client can collect the information. This allows you also some complex cases like outbound testing quite easily. Yeah, then um, when we collect the results, then we have another component, maybe yeah, they get collected in a in a raw or XML file format, and after that, a job gets executed, which actually builds the report out of the collected data. Mm. But this is um, highly configurable. So um, the whole idea was to not limit the ability by a given instruction set, which is, for example, let's. In the, in the beginning, we started with ideas like, oh, well, let's call it like verify user policy. And we decided at the end to change that whole idea and just put some, uh, we call that atomic functions, so very small piece of functions, 
which to, for example, upload, download, stuff like that, like in, in Metoprito, but it's highly abstracted, so it's easier, so you don't have to take care and pass stuff like that, and to allow then the user to have the full flexibility of using that individual commands in a, in a script language style, which should be easier to handle. This allows uh, a more flexible way, but has some drawbacks that uh, you have even for simple tasks, sometimes you have to write more state, multiple statements, but you can save them aside and use them as a lab module during the next tests, if you like. Yeah, but uh, on the other hand, um, uh, we can make this all, uh, whole thing uh, platform independent. So it doesn't matter if you upload a file or the command, uh, doesn't differ from uh, one system to another. So if you upload a file on a Unix, it looks the same uh, like uploading a file in Windows. Yeah, so the, frame, uh, the, the session handler basically decides on the, on the session which uh, command will be executed at the end. So I skip now the individual components. So basically, again, it looks like that. A client connects to the server. The server uh, prepares uh, basically some storage locations, checks for, for jobs, and then uh, delivers instruction to be executed to the client and delivers instruction to itself to be executed and at the end the data gets collected and a report can be generated and in this case reviewed from the client but it can be generated wherever you want. Um, why did we decide to, to not uh, build in too many comments natively? Uh, by ourselves, it's because we wanted to, to uh, not limit the, the usage of a specific tool. For example, maybe a company does not like that you use the scanner X instead of scanner Y, or uh, you have a specific software testing functionality testing tool that you like to be uploaded and executed automatically if someone connects. Um, you can easily exchange that. So basically, all the underlying commands are not included in the framework itself. I mean, we have some test cases already prepared. That's fine. We use most of the time functionalities already available on the on the on end system. But it's your choice if you want, for example, to use MBSA by uploading them to the system, then execute it, and take the report again and collect the information. I mean, that's not our our uh, scope to take care on on what you actually do. That's the the, the the scope of the person which writes the test cases. <clears throat> yeah, if we are looking on some examples, what we can do with this plugin, uh, one thing is we can uh, check file and registry entries, make hash keys of them, um, something like uh, Tripwire does, actually. So, um, we can verify the integrity of a system. So if you have a system set up, we can scan it one time and periodic, uh, periodically afterwards and compare the different hash sums of the different files or registry keys. Yeah, and it's not only the only uh, configuration testing, you can also make functional and expected functionality testing. Or, for example, if you have a development team and they make a mistake, it will be fixed. You can write some test cases which always uh, can be implemented um, during the testing procedures that this bug is not re-implemented in that version, so you simply write one test case. A good example is as well, um, I mean, a lot of people using uh, policies distribute them, but in fact, for example, the policy is not completely applied to the registry, especially if, you, uh, if you're using standalone machine, that's quite uh, Complicated, so you can, for example, provide a policy file which is available on your domain, but you can, for example, verify quite easily what's the actual registration setting against the intended settings of the uh, of the policy. So you can differ basically uh, and uh, define what will happen if the policy is switched off or it cannot apply a certain setting. What's the setting of the system itself? So. Uh, that's quite simple. Then uh, automated software testing rules. It's uh, quite well known in terms of functionality testing. There are some test cases out there. 
Um, we don't have to wrote that by ourselves. In theory, we did not implement it so far. It is also possible to attach as a debugger on the remote system and fuss it from the remote side and get information back. Or you can, especially if you have already a test case, a specific one, you can inspect memory <laughs> attached to it, you can make new processes, whatever you like, and still having the control on the client side what information is actually going through. And the server can keep control of the data which is coming back from the server. So that's quite interesting, but um, we did not include that one as a demo here. Uh, one example I also would like to mention uh, is about forensic. So um, if you are, have to analyze a system uh, after a breaking, uh, yeah, the functionality is all there. So you can build hash sum from all files. You can um, make time tables, which file changed at which time, stuff like that. Just to be clear, that's not uh, for using as a and you don't uh, change the system at all. I mean, for sure you need to execute an executable and change the landscape, but quite often you don't have that problem that you have to analyze it offline, but you can, for example, really quickly define it once and search for certain appearances in the different clients. So, yes, forensically, but not in uh, terms of, of uh, um, a non changeable system. Yeah. I mean, it's a running system and you run something on that device. Um, you, uh, it's quite cool, Metasploit provides us a functionality to execute something in a dummy process. That's quite okay. Uh, so you don't have to actually upload and install the whole binary thing. Uh, there are some limitations, but that's uh, quite cool. So you don't have to really upload the application every time. Um, the real need gets basically explained best if you take two examples. So here we have the inbound test. So for example, I execute on the client a simple command edge dot minus n r a r n, and uh, I will get some lists of listening ports, port sets. Um, then I can get the configuration of the local firewall as well, for example, and I can execute a network scan from the outside as well, mm -hmm. from the server. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I mean, that's quite simple. The cool thing is that I can uh, start that from one location, but the real power is now that I can collect that information. I mean, for sure, yes, it's quite challenging to write those um, test cases, but you do it once, and independently how you enter a system, you can still execute the te test cases as far you can manage to execute a servo, uh, a metropolitan uh, servo component on the client. So, I mean, that's pretty obvious. And in the other direction, Outbound, that's uh, quite complicated for a lot of products these days, and it's quite simple in here. Yeah, so um, the first step is that we uh, ask the client to do some name resolution. So we ask the local installed uh, Internet Explorer, for example, to resolve IBM.com or porn or evil.com. Uh, if, if this is working, then we again get the firewall configuration and look at the settings which which connection would get blocked on the client itself and then we ask the client to actually do the connections to fake servers on on the current server and then we can verify these settings so in this example uh, it would be possible for the Internet Explorer to get to www.evil.com but uh, some kind of firewall in between is blocking the request. So this allows you for example making an assumption well the local firewall does not block that website so there is another me mechanism in place <coughs> or you can use it for validating your for example whitelisting of your proxy server or network boundaries stuff like that. So. Um, we have prepared. Oh, I did not store it. I need to for anyway. Store it. So now I switch to mirror mode, so you can see it as well. Okay, 
So, That's the last arc we finish now because uh, task because mm -hmm. um, um, we initially quick prototype it in, in PHP and the rest is Ruby, so this doesn't make sense. So we will port it over. Um, so and for additional larger scale testing, we need a client interfa uh, interface interface uh, which is command line based anyway. So this is basically the command line interface, and this allows you just to to add task, delete task. You can modify the database. That's just basically the database which holds. It's in fact SQLite at the moment, which holds just the the uh, actual job. So it's quite straightforward. Um, um, you have a job number which is unique. You have some comments. Then you have a status of the job. <coughs> you have uh, the matching filters, and you have some templates with which the jobs are based on. So you can make templates, for example, here, outbound testing, assign that one to a specific IP or a range, or that range, or a MAC address, and it will, uh, it will pick the most specific one. Uh, so I just prepared three of them. That's uh, IP3, 4, and 5, so I will change the IP of my target to show it to you. Um, let's see. <laughs> I will start it with enhanced user rights because um, I will use fake demons on port 80 and 53, so I need to have uh, higher privileges. Um, yeah, and wow, it's just loading an additional plugin with some parameters, that's, that's all. And the first one is a small, let's call it inventory scan. Okay. when we're suspending, uh, suspending the distance. Uh, the, uh, the okay, now let's try it again. Okay, over there it just says, well, there is a connection, it sends over the rest of the of the interpreter um, server side, and then it starts to um, start <coughs> to build up an environment on the client, uh, just a temporary uh, directory. It's not needed if you don't have a test case for it. Um, for example, if you don't need to upload files or you don't need to download a specific file in that um, directory, you don't have a need for that one. Um, then it uses a functionality called <coughs> Railgun to make a native API call on the client just to tell them, well, there is a message box. Later on, in the background now, all the commands get, ex commands get executed. I mean, that's not very uh, special. I just let it run in there. Um, and open it up the, um, there. So um, let's open. Um, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So 
So just, I mean, now it's scanning actually what's the unique identification. That's 4885. That one. So, for example, in here there is always a file called main in instruction. This is basically some, some set of um, commands to be executed. Um, Miko. Yeah. Um, pretty straightforward, actually. Um, there is a difference between a remote execute and remote execute read. It's just um, redirecting the standard out to the to the server, so to directly save the information there. You have some info, uh, some some let's say cleanup functionalities which downloads the directory from the client and remove it pretty root in here. And then you have some statements about um, where we start, where we end, and then we have some includes. I mean. For, for making uh, such a thing useful, you have to have uh, some, some includes. For example, for nmap, it's quite trivial, just a command. Uh, for winenum, for example, uh, in here we just do that next start, and there are a bunch of other commands which will not be executed, otherwise it takes too long. And for wmic, for just querying the configuration database, that's uh, quite straightforward. A neat trick is that I use a small tool which actually gets the clipboard. The problem with um, Vemic seems to be that the uh, output is, is somehow strangely buffered, so you cannot just redirect the output, otherwise the console will hang. Uh, that's a quite common problem. So you normally have to locally store first the files and then transfer it. We find a way to use the clipboard as a temporary um, storage, so you don't uh, have actually written files to disk, that's the whole idea of it. Um, I mean, the nice thing is that you can easily also make a test case for repeatedly steal information for clipboards. Could be an issue if you use password managers. Um, but I mean, it's quite straightforward, you just tell them what to execute. You have a status and you have a file which is called report gen in here, and that's basically just triggered at the end of the of the functionality down here, and which will, in, in that case, specific case, will convert some text files into XML and copy it to a different folder, and at the end execute the uh, XML transformation. And at the end, you get a report. I um, mean, by the time it's it's finished, if you scroll up in that log, you will see that nmap was running, that's from the server side, and if we look now at the report in this example, um, So, I mean, that's just an uh, RT report that I quickly hacked together using the, the last few few hours. I mean, there's a, just a text and a table. I mean, that's pretty straightforward out of the XML, nothing fancy. The really cool thing is, I mean, we generated in the report generator some <laughs> statistics, and down here, for example, you can now easily uh, get the output of next shot and, for example, color it, or I just added as text in here, the state gathered from the NMAP. So this just shows you that basically that information is validated from the outside. And if you look at the table, you can easily identify, well, there is one port uh, down here, and uh, it's established. And yeah, first of all, I just scanned the first thousand ports, so it wouldn't be detected at all, even if it's list list uh, listening. Um, and I mean, I hope you get the idea out of it. So you can have multiple different information sources, and you can handle it from one testing location. I'm pretty much sure you, uh, if you do testing, you have to take care of such stuff by yourself by now and adopt to your client's environment. So let's change it to another IP address. Um, that's the, just let me check which one. 
outbound is the actor 3. For example, that outbound testing So again, the same setup, just execute the same executable again, because now it has a different IP address, the client gets another template. Um, so again, a message box will be displayed. It's quite uh, crazy that this display of the message box actually took so long. I mean, it's two API calls natively out of Raygon, but it takes quite a lot of time to execute it. I don't know why. I did not investigate how they really did it. Uh, and now you can see that um, in that case scenario, which start first two auxil auxiliary modules of Metasploit, and this shows that you can use the power of Metasploit basically as well. So we start a fake DNS daemon, and a uh, slightly modified HTTP capture daemon, which just basically saves all the requests coming in. And that's uh, 37 and 92. Yeah, absolutely perfect. 37. Ooh, that's the one. If you look at that instruction file, oh, maybe I just open again the whole directory to, to open with. Locations. Yeah, search again. Textmate. <coughs> so if you look at that one, for example, it's quite easy. I mean, I have a uh, made a different file for the outbound testing in here, which basically um, first start the auxiliary services. I mean, that's quite easy to do. You just specify what uh, module we call parameter. Then you execute, basically. Um, I did not have the time to do that natively using Raygun, so I used uh, uh, basically a Visual Basic script, which uh, calls the Internet Explorer. That's because I don't... Um, I'm not at the desktop at the moment when I'm in Metaplator. I can migrate to Explore XE. Um, this could be automated as well, because you can also execute any existing Metaplator script uh, from inside um, that color plugin as well. So, and then I just try to uh, force the client to connect porn.com. I mean, the fake server will answer that request if it gets there. And, um, yeah. At the end, I write some statements into an XML file what, what command was sent to the client just to keep track of it. <coughs> so the outcome of it would be saved into a it's very simple XML <coughs> structure which is really abused just for simplicity. Um, basically, just the two requests which were collected. Um, I sent three. I mean, those were the three, Porn, Heise, and Good. And I slightly modified the reporting generation just to collect that information. And when I now look at this report, I mean, reporting is completely up to you how to do it. I just made a table out of it. So basically, it's XSL with some X path in it and magic. Um, it just sees what, what uh, uh, was requested, what was received, and at the end you can see, well, www.porn is uh, failed or blocked. In that case, it depends on how you look at it. Um, and uh, Heise and Good was received by the cell. And now you can add further information like configuration for your firewall, stuff like that. This was just what was sent, what was received, somewhere is a gap. So this should show you that even in in, um, in more complicated environment it should work. So, the last one. Yeah, we can one as well. Um, 39. Yeah, I can. I don't think that I have to execute. Um, close that one. So 
So the job 39, basically is something like a It's something like a, a SHA-1 sum collector. Uh, the problem is really if you, uh, you could, uh, for example, use a, a, uh, a tool which is collecting you MD5s without actually writing it to the disk using that fake dummy process in memory injection concept. But the problem is that you cannot provide um, arguments to that specific one uh, at the moment, at least how it's implemented. Um, so I had to upload it first and execute it for a simple demo. So basically, it just collects some 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 hashes, and it just put it into the raw directory for now. And you could easily right now report that that uh, compares, for example, that hashes to another one. So I mean. If you, for example, have certain versions of your application, you can use that not maybe forensically, but for, to ensure that the, uh, the application or the individual files are really the same. I mean, um, searching for a specific DLL based on version does not might be a good idea, so you use the hash. This could be a good example for that. Um, so, for the structure, <coughs> it's quite easy. <coughs> If you check out the git, you just low, um, link three files into the directory of Metasploit. One is the plugin itself, one is the startup script, which can be executed using Power R on Metasploit. And after that, you um, just have all the information below the plugin. And it's quite simple. You have something where the code is, somewhere where the code is, and you have a template directory where all templates are <coughs> available. So for example, I use that uh, outbound test, it's down in here. If I add a new client, it will be copied into a new directory which has a top <coughs> number. At the moment, it's file system based because of some requirements we had in the beginning. And I mean, I guess you get the idea of um, how the individual jobs, I guess 33 was it? will be copied over and if the, if the client then really connects and executes the job, the results will be handled into the, uh, in the results directory and for example down here 37 and as you can see you can have multiple. I mean if you run the same test twice on the, on the same computer, you don't want to overwrite the test with the next one, so you have some differences. So we make some uh, unique numbering out of it to ensure that it's not overwritten. Um, that's basically the whole story about structure. I mean, it's not that um, fancy. So I'm going back to, I guess, three slides. The question is, does it scale? Um, yeah, yes, for sure. Um, we can have multiple instances of the um, Metasploit and Carrot server instances, uh, maybe in different networks, uh, they can have separate databases, they can connect to one database, to a common database. Um, yeah. yeah. The idea for the next future is uh, including a native OVAL interpreter. So OVAL <coughs> is basically a descriptive language based on, uh, around XML, where you uh, define test cases for vulnerabilities, configuration, and uh, what else? Compliance checks. Um, the nice thing is that it's based on the vulnerability databases, and you get every month new test cases for the common vulnerabilities, so you don't have to write them for them for your own. At the moment, you can easily take the, the default tool, the default tool for them for, from their website, upload it, and add individual XML if you like, but we think that it makes absolutely sense to, to at least allow a user to say, use the same language to define test cases. Because uh, we, want to, we are lazy and we want to save ourselves some time, so this would save us a lot of time in terms of NIST checking or compliance. Uh, for example, there are tests for is there a, any USB device connected, so I don't have to write that by now. Um, 
The next thing is the platform abstraction to implement it for real. The problem is that at the time we started, the POSIX one was not available, and now it's available, so it should be an easy task to just split that up. And rebuilding of the web GUI, which is basically the last task that we do because um, it's just uh, for easy management. The idea is that you have all your test cases in the templates and you can choose which uh, instructions you want to merge and then execute it. And, um, but the problem, in, or the problem, no, the design of that whole idea is that you have to know what you're actually doing. So it just helps you by providing you a schedule, nothing more, nothing less. So it's not that fancy, but it provides you exactly the missing piece between using um, individual metapater scripts and adopting to the different scenarios to fully automating using the power of the individual components. Basically, we are done. Um, I have two questions already prepared and answered. Yes, it can be abused. And yes, it provides you some insecurity. I mean, it's up to you to remove exploitation abilities of Metasploit if you don't like it. Um, there is a SSL support available which always generates a new certificate. That's maybe not the intended use in that case, but you can easily I remove that and provide a def defined SSL certificate so that everyone can connect. And uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, for sure, it needs the appropriate context and user rights. But the cool thing is, you can uh, adopt your use cases to your um, environment. So, <coughs> for example, you can verify first was it a meet breed or running a system on a Windows system, or is it a PHP version running inside of the web server uh, process so you don't have that much privilege and you can easily detect that and react accordingly and uh, yeah that's basically the whole thing about it and where can you download it um, we did not manage to uh, implement the, uh, the git openly at the moment so it's still uh, depending on, on your SSH key. Um, the IT operation department within DreamLab is fixing that, um, I guess, during the next few days. Uh, if you need access, uh, just send me an email and I will add a key for you, and then you can just get it out of the Git. Um, and then it's pretty straightforward. It's a simple Ruby. We don't <coughs> use um, too much object orientation programming because it simply doesn't make sense in that context because you have one object that's the session and the rest is basically operating top down on your instructions so yes it has some but it's pretty easy code to read and write and uh, if you want to provide test cases feel free um, yeah you can reach us on, uh, on our website so now for questions I mean, Okay, so well, we're all ready. We're faster than expected. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.